Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 451, June the 4th, 2015, Monday. Thank you so much for tuning in. Alrighty, uh, okay, well it was a, kind of a slow news day today on Sunday. Not, much, not a lot going on, but there's uh, some things that we want to get to here. And I want to drill down just a little bit more on this uh, six agency um, task force uh, that I talked about yesterday. I gave a lot of information yesterday. I had to put out a lot of information in a short period of time. So I didn't really get a chance to focus too much on that. So I just want to kind of go through that one more time at the end of this video. So it's really clear in everyone's mind exactly what, what I'm putting out there because it's uh, pretty groundbreaking to say in the least. I don't know that anyone else is... Uh, taking that leap. I'm the first one, I guess, but we'll see if others follow and if it turns out to be true. But before we get to that, uh, I just want to say hello to quite a few people who came over from uh, Tracy Bean's channel. Uh, I had someone, I guess, that left a link or told people about me or whatever on her last video, the one that dealt with uh, the uh, Papagalopoulos and uh, Peter Strzok issue and the timing. And uh, I've been a subscriber to Tracy Bean's channel for over a year. Uh, she's a great researcher, one of my favorite YouTubers, by the way. Uh, I've used information from her work on uh, quite a few of my videos. I've had a couple of videos almost totally dedicated the entire video to something she's discovered or uncovered. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, we certainly have a lot of things in common. We're both sniffing down the same trail. We have a different approach to how we do our videos, but we're essentially running parallel with one another on the track that we're on. And, and we kind of stay focused on the same things. She's like me. She doesn't get real distracted by a million other things on the peripheral. She stays locked into the really uh, uh, the core of what we're trying to accomplish here, which is to unravel the truth about the deep state coup, spygate, whatever you want to call it. So welcome to all of uh, you who have come over from Tracy Bean's channel. I uh, appreciate you. And uh, yeah, it's good to have you, and um, you know it's, it's always good to share information uh, amongst us because I'm sure Tracy, like myself, or H. A. Goodman, or Sticks, or anyone else that you talk to, this these there's so much out there. No one person can possibly cover it all. You almost uh, this is why you have to be kind of narrow in your focus. You can't get going down you know too many different roads or expand what you're doing uh, too widely. Or, or else you, you just end up in the woods and you, you, you can't discover anything. You, you've kind of got to pick a track and follow it. And, uh, you know, get, try to be as specific as you can uh, and, you know, with what you're doing or, or you'll just get really distracted and confused. So, anyway, uh, I love Tracy Bean's work and uh, it's great to have anybody who's a sub to her come over and uh, watch my videos too. So, that's great. Um, alrighty. So, uh, and thanks to whoever it was on my channel. It may have been Gordon, I think. Uh, I think I saw Gordon posting up something there on her channel. So, uh, thanks, Gordon, if you're the one that dropped that hint. Because I don't go into other people's channels and drop my links and promote myself on other people's channels. I just don't know if it's exactly right to do that. So, I, I never, hard, well, I can't say I've never, but I, I, I don't make a point of promoting my channel on other people's, in other people's comments sections. Is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so a lot of people saw Devin Nunes this morning on Maria Bartiromo, <laughs> and I think a lot of people were expecting uh, Devin Nunes to come out and really go after Trey Gowdy, but, you know, he's not going to do that. Um, he did essentially say that um, he has a different view <laughs> on whether or not uh, the uh, spies were spying on Trump's campaign or spying on Russians. Uh, I guess it's a, a matter of semantics. Uh, but Devin Nunes pointed out that he obviously doesn't see it the same way as, as, as Trey Gowdy. He, he does see the spies as being there to, you know, spy on Trump's campaign, even though Gowdy doesn't see it. Nunes did say, yeah, he pretty much sees that that's what he thinks it is. So, but I didn't expect uh, Nunes was going to come out there and really hammer um, Trey Gowdy the way other people have in the past few days since he did that interview on Fox. Because Gowdy, I mean, Nunes has to work with Gowdy. You know, he, you know, so it's not a bridge he wants to burn. He doesn't have a lot of allies as it is. And uh, it's those two committees that are primarily the ones trying to get documents, trying to get witnesses, and trying to do this. So, you know, I, I think Gow Devin Nunes, I think, is, has been skeptical of Gowdy for things he said in the past, like when he said he didn't want to rehash or reopen the Hillary Clinton email investigation, even though there never really was 
an actual email investigation. It was fixed. Uh, so, you know, I mean, obviously there's a divide there between Nunez and Gaudi, but Gaudi, you know, Nunez is, is not going to go, you know, savage uh, Gaudi because he has to work with him and, you know, various other things. So I, I wasn't surprised, but uh, it wasn't a bad interview, but, you know, uh, he did say the same thing that Jordan and Meadows have said about the fact that they're, after four months of not interviewing witnesses, they now are going to begin Re, you know, interviewing witnesses again, and of course, the first three are those three FBI guys, which they'll be speaking to the issue of the handling of the email investigation, which is following right in line with what the IG report is going to be talking about. So that was coordinated and planned for that reason. But sometime in the next two or three weeks, uh, according to Meadows, and I think Nunez even stated this, that they are going to be interviewing Prestep and possibly. Peter's been stroking us. Now, I, I imagine they could interview Lisa Page, but they would probably have to subpoena her. They could request, they could send her a letter and ask that she come, um, but I doubt that she would. Uh, they could subpoena her and could probably force her to come, but she could just sit there and plead the fifth. So I don't know if we'll hear from Lisa Page, but Priestep is really a key person to hear from. Um, he's really a key person to hear from, and he's also a very key person uh, as far as James Comey's concerned, because remember, it was James Comey when he was asked why he did not tell the Congress about the investigation that was going on into the Trump-Russia collusion, and specifically into Trump associates, uh, why he didn't tell the Congress about that or why he didn't brief them on that. He said it's because the head of counterintelligence at the FBI suggested he not do so. But it's very strange that at the same time, uh, Brennan admits to briefing the Gang of Eight. So during that fall, uh, late summer, Comey uh, does not tell the Congress about the uh, investigation. But just a month or two later, you know, we have Brennan who tells us that he was advising. And so you got to wonder what's going on there. Uh, there's some things that are not adding up. You know, you got Brennan saying, well, I didn't know anything about the dossier until I think maybe December of 2016. Well, gosh, they were they were using it to get FISA warrants uh, back in the summer. How could they be using the dossier to get FISA warrants back in the summer of 2016? And John Brennan, who's supposedly hardcore into this investigation, which he began long even before the FBI did, and he's not, he's not, you know, become aware of the dossier until December, six months, almost six months after the FBI has been using it to get FISA warrants, but yet he's briefing Congress on his findings from the intelligence he's getting uh, from, you know, the British intel and everything, but Comey is, is not briefing Congress. I mean, you see, the, the, there's just a lot of things uh, at this point that have to get aired out. And it's only going to happen, I think, if you get a special counsel, convene a grand jury, bring these guys in, put them in front of a grand jury, and get it out and get it on the record. Uh, there'll be some perjury committed. There'll be some lies. Hopefully you'll catch most of them. But this is the only way we're going to get to the bottom of this because uh, we just have too many different individuals involved in this giving us too much information. It just does not work. It just does not work. So... Anyway, getting back to the Devin Nunes thing, uh, you know, I wasn't surprised he didn't go after Gowdy. Uh, no great revelations other than the fact that he's talking about the fact that uh, he's basically admitting that they uh, that they still haven't they still aren't getting the documents that they want. So we'll just have to keep watching, and I don't know what pressure they're that they're going to bring or what they can do. Um, <clears throat> I kind of get the impression, though, just this is just another gut instinct thing I have, and just watching politics for a long time, I know how these things work. Um, because we're like five months out from a midterm election, uh, there's a lot of people, uh, I'm, I'm talking about Republicans uh, right now, <clears throat> not Democrats. There's a lot of Republicans um, who, when, when those guys are coming up into an election, they don't like to handle any political hot potatoes, anything that could be controversial, anything that could be used against them. They don't like to give anybody any ammunition. They, they, they try to say as little as possible other than when they're out there campaigning and then everything they say has been scripted, written, and memorized. 
And so issues like this, when you get into wanting to launch these investigations, uh, use subpoena power to get documents, uh, push hard on the DOJ, call for you know uh, the firing of Rodenstein, the firing of Sessions, all these sorts of things are very, very dicey to a lot of these Republicans who are writing the fence. They're not, you know, they're just self-interested. Uh, they're not particularly Trump lovers. They probably didn't like him all that much, but he's a president. And their, their, their success or their sticking around and keeping their seat probably has a lot to do with how well he does. So they're kind of vested in the president, whether they want to be or not. But in Typically, when you get close to elections, especially midterm election, where you have only 20 some odd seats, 25, 26 seats, uh, separating the, the House from either going Republican or going Democrat or staying Republican, a lot of these Republicans who might be worried about losing their seats or whatever, they just don't want to get in the middle of a political um, uh, controversy. So I think that uh, the, the feeling I get just from watching Devin Nunes is he's kind of resigned himself to the fact that things are going to be on the slow roll. We're probably going to be other than the IG uh, coming out with something that uh, would be so alarming that they would immediately call for special counsel and it would be hard for certain individuals, Republicans, not to get on board. But as much as possible, a lot of these guys are going to try to stay out of the fray until the 2018 elections. And I think Nunes is kind of playing this game. He's playing this game where we just got to make it to the 2018 elections, maintain the House, so we can maintain our leadership positions, so we can then keep these investigations going. And once we win the House back and we're locked in, then at that point it becomes a whole different game uh, for the perps, because now they can't hope that a midterm election is going to change their fortunes. They'll now realize that their fortunes have not changed, the Republicans are still in charge, and then their game plan will have to change drastically uh, for how they uh, try to avoid prosecution for their crimes. But at the same time, a lot of those Republicans who are having to play it safe and don't want to get in the fray right now and may not want to jump behind Nunes or support the effort, other than the hardcore members of the Freedom Caucus, I mean, which is about 30 some odd guys. But those other 150, 200, they're sitting on the sidelines. They don't want to get themselves in the political fray and provide ammunition for their opponent for the midterms. So I think Nunes understands the political aspect of this and he is basically just um, writing it out in, in a sense. They're going to interview witnesses, they're going to follow up on the IG reports, they're going to keep subpoenas and stuff, but he's probably not going to try to bring the real heat because he's not going to find the support. He's got three dozen guys who will maybe have his back. And that's just really not enough to bring the type of pressure he wants to bring. But I believe that Nunes in his mind is that once we get past the midterms and we hold on to the house, which we have to do, hold on to the house, we all keep our positions, then at that point, a lot of these weak kneed Republicans um, are going to have to come our direction and get on board. And he'll find a lot, I think he believes he'll find a lot more support for hardcore subpoena actions, uh, threatening uh, uh, possibly impeachment against Rosenstein or anyone who's not turning over the documents, could be Sessions, whoever. So I think that there's a political calculation involved in all of this because we're so close to the midterm elections. And that's just the way I'm reading it. Uh, I could be wrong, but it's just the way I'm reading things right now. Next topic. Yeah, Giuliani. <laughs> I'm not suggesting he's watching my videos, but when he was talking about uh, working out something so the president could talk to Mueller, and I did a video, of course, as most of you know, I was frantic. And I'm like, no, 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 please. You didn't bring in Rudy. I mean, here we bring in Rudy. We think we're bringing in Rudy, and he's going to go in there and say, hey, you know, I know about all those pics on that Anthony Weiner laptop, and, and if you don't drop your investigation, I'm going to make sure that my buddies down in New York uh, make sure those pictures get out or whatever. That didn't happen, so obviously he doesn't have that kind of information, or he isn't willing to play that card. That ship has sailed, okay? So now we're quite a few weeks past that. And, um, but I've done quite a few videos and I comment on this sort of thing. And I suggested to Rudy, or not to him personally, I don't know that he probably doesn't watch my videos, but, but I suggested if, you know, my legal strategy would be to do the same thing that's being done to you. Rope-a-dope, slow walk, drag it out, run the clock out. I mean, if you look at the situation, the longer this goes on, the stronger Trump gets and the weaker Mueller gets. So 
with that fact in mind, I would say the simple solution would be to, uh, as I said in that video, if I was Rudy, I would go sit down with Mueller and say, yeah, well, we want to sit down and talk to you. The president wants to talk to you. Here's exactly all. If you'll just agree to these things, we'll have this meeting. And of course, knowing good and well that there's things there that Mueller will never agree to. So that Mueller has to come back and say, well, we've read through your options here. And yeah, there's some things here we can't, we can't work with. Uh, at which point, Jill and I can just say, great, uh, we're almost there. We're close. We're 80%. There's a few things we disagree on. Let's go back to our corners, work on it with our folks, and let's get back together again in a couple weeks and try again. And you just keep doing this. You just keep putting out there that, you, that the president really wants to talk to you, Uncle Bob. And uh, we really want him to talk to you as well. But we have to work out some issues here to figure out how we're going to do it so that it's fair to the president and fair to you, quite honestly. So look, we're going to do that. So, And you just keep doing this over and over and over again, dragging it out, getting together with Mueller, putting together something that you know there'll be things that he won't go along with, won't agree to. Then you have to go back to corner to come back and have another meeting. And you just keep doing this all the way into the 2018 election. And if he's going to drop something in a report, let him go ahead and drop it. But once he, but his report doesn't come out till he's done. So you put Uncle Bob in a tough situation. Does he play rope a dope with you all the way into 2018 and possibly beyond, or does he realizing that part of the plan was for him to drop a, a report at, at, just before the election, which the Democrats could use uh, that report uh, for propaganda in the midterm election? which they hoped would help them win, and then they come back, they got the report, they win the House, and they start having impeachment hearings based on the report that Mueller put out. I think this was the, the plan. Um, but by Giuliani doing this rope-a-dope thing, uh, it's been very effective, and it's what I suggested he do. Now, Uncle Bob is not stupid, and he's not going to allow himself to be played that hard. But I was just talking about buying as much time as you can. I don't know that you can buy all the way to the 2018 election. Uncle Bob isn't that stupid to be played like that. But you can play him at least ways maybe until the middle of the summer. Because uh, because he can't come back to you and just say, no, we're, we're just, it's not going to work that way. It's either this or this or nothing. Because then that makes him look like he's not being flexible, not working. See, So he's in a position, he has to wheel and deal too. But he'll only do it to a certain point when he realizes, okay, they're just playing me. They have no intention of having Trump come and talk to me. Okay, so, but you play the game as long as you can play it. And then when that's over, you try another tactic. Now, I think that Giuliani is getting close to that point, or he thinks Mueller is getting close to that point. So he rolled out his newest tactic, which I like. <laughs> and his newest tactic is to say, well, I don't know if you guys caught this, but Giuliani was on TV on Sunday morning. And he said, well, you know, we've decided that uh, we're not going to uh, arrange any meeting for, uh, for, for Trump to talk to Uncle Bob until they release the notes on Spygate. We want the Spygate documents. Once we get the Spygate documents, then we'll talk about sitting down <laughs> with Uncle Bob. So now he's, he's moved the goalposts. Giuliani's moved the goalposts. He's totally changed it. And now he's put the onus on, essentially, the DOJ. Uh, uh, to so he's saying to the DOJ, hey, if you don't release those Spygate documents, those Spygate notes, we're not going to talk to Uncle Bob. So it's it's just another excellent move by Giuliani. Uh, he, he he knows that this will probably have no bearing on him getting the Spygate notes and whatever Trump wanted to see he could probably see anyway by declassifying it. Okay, so, but it's just another way to run the cl clock out and play the game because, uh, quite honestly, Giuliani is. He's, he's, you know, he's not stupid politically. He's looking at things and he sees that Trump keeps getting stronger and Uncle Bob keeps getting weaker. And if you can deny Uncle Bob the ability to put out a report in the fall, uh, and based on the fact that the polls are already turning in favor of Republicans and away from Democrats, it's a brilliant political strategy, not just for Trump and the Mueller issue uh, and the investigation issue. It's a great strategy to work for the uh, all the Republicans running for Congress in 2018. It takes something off the table that they don't want to have to deal with in a debate or they don't want to have TV commercials run against them or whatever. So it's it's really a good uh, political strategy. And right now, because again, we're so close to the election, we're all focused on this investigation. We, to, as far as you and I are concerned, we don't give a damn about politics. We're not running for an election. We want the whole thing unearthed now. But these guys are politicians. And you cannot take the politics out of anything in Washington, including investigations or anything else. So I just think that, unfortunately, we have to consider the political factors. And uh, 
it's unfortunate, but th that's kind of the way it is. So it's just my thoughts on that. You know, isn't it funny? <laughs> There's just a million of these things that you can do. I, you could sit there and do this stuff all day. Just these interesting, uh, you know, terms that you can put on phrases that you hear these guys say. So I heard recently, I can't remember who it was, it may have been Clapper. It might have been, I think it was Clapper. It was talking about the FBI, the DOJ, the CIA, felt that they had to launch um, this full deep state surveillance on Trump and the Trump campaign um, because they felt like, uh, or they're telling us, because they were concerned about the Russians infiltrating the Trump campaign, uh, you know, co-opting uh, maybe low-level members of his administration or people on the peripheral, uh, people in his uh, uh, team, his campaign team. Mainly they're talking about Carter Page and Manafort and Papagalopoulos and people like that. So isn't it funny how they say that it was this fear that Russia might involve themselves uh, in the campaign by getting these associations with people um, in the Trump campaign, and that's what caused them to launch national security letters, massive uh, Title I FISA warrants, three renewals, um, spies, informants, agent provocateurs, uh, private contractors, and they threw everything they had against the wall. And we're told it's because they feared Russians uh, getting a, a meddling into the election or or, or getting uh, their, their roots into the Trump campaign. <laughs> this is what they say. Yet, isn't it funny that the DN servers, DNC servers are allegedly hacked two or three times. They bring in CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike does the report, which they put out, I think it was about the first week of May, May 6th or something like that. They put out the report saying it was the Russians. Yet, the FBI, the CIA, the DOJ, and all the rest have no particular interest in going to get in those servers. Oh, yeah, they ask. But they certainly didn't ask Papagalopoulos if he wanted to be wiretapped, or Carter Page, or Manafort. They didn't ask about national security letters, about agent provocateurs. They go through all this in the Trump campaign because, allegedly, Papagalopoulos told Downer about the Russians having some dirt. But yet, when they have actual physical hacking of what they believe is, or what they're saying they believe, is physical hacking of the DNC servers, documents leaked to WikiLeaks, which does release them, and which does obviously have an impact on, on Hillary's supporters. Uh, there were Bernie supporters who were, who were injured, but they probably would have voted Democrat, would have voted for Hillary, had that stuff not come out. But once it came out that they were screwing Bernie, a lot of them Bernie bros didn't show up for Hillary. So it did impact uh, the vote, the turnout for Hillary uh, from all the Bernie bros who didn't come out to vote for her. So isn't it funny that they got all worked up and put all this stuff into motion because of this tip they got of a conversation between Papagalopoulos and Downer, but yet when they have actual servers getting hacked, the actual uh, uh, emails actually being transferred to WikiLeaks, actually being released, they had no, n no interest in uh, getting subpoenas to get those servers. They, they didn't launch uh, surveillance on uh, people there at the DNC. They didn't uh, have a big major investigation, send agent provocateurs into the DNC to try to figure it out. They didn't do any of that stuff to keep Hillary safe. Oh, yeah, to do it for her own good. I mean, isn't that what they're telling us that they did for Trump? They did it for his own good. He should have been happy. Well, gosh, wouldn't the DNC, uh, D DCCC, and the Rotten Reverend Clinton have been happy if they had put some agent provocateurs in the DNC after the servers were hacked? <laughs> you see how that works, folks? You see how that works? You can do this stuff all day long. Oh, well. Now, you guys know I like Sarah Carter a lot. She's a great reporter and uh, does a lot of really good stuff. But... Like most people in the mainstream, they stay way behind where we are. And that has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, I can come on YouTube and I can take, I can reach. I can reach pretty far. I can look at a lot of different facts and say, well, you know, this is a stretch, but this is what I think may be going on. Now, a lot of the times I've been proven correct and some of the times I'm not correct. Sarah Carter can't take quite the risk I take. Uh, but having said that, uh, this story that she's... Uh, getting the most credit for doing recently uh, about the she wrote this story about uh, a week ago uh, where she laid out the fact and she went on Hannity and other places and said yeah we now have proof that 
all this surveillance began long before 2016, July of 2016. It, it was going on uh, maybe as early as 2015 with, uh, you know, the CIA getting uh, intelligence from the UK. Well, obviously, um, if you watch my videos or other people, I'm sure watch the videos, you'll find that we've known about this for a year. <laughs> we've been talking about this for a year. Um, so not quite a year, but pretty close to it since, I uh, guess, what, September of 2017, is when we really st was when we really got turned on to this whole idea that there was a lot of stuff that was actually happening long before 2016 and it was happening on the other side of the pond. So uh, yes, I'm glad that Sarah Carter is now on to that and that she's reporting on that, uh, that a lot of this stuff was coming from uh, British intelligence long before the FBI uh, admits to launching their investigations. Um, I'm waiting for Sarah Carter now to discover a few other things, and I'm going to go through them right now. Uh, the first one, of course, is the thing I talked about yesterday, which is this um, CIA six agency inner task force started by John Brennan, which is what was really running everything, okay, as I laid out in the video yesterday. Um, I don't think she's discovered that yet, and what's funny about this is that this is not something that just popped up. I and many other people heard about it over a year ago. It was uh, in the summer of 2017. John Brennan was on, I think, MSNBC with Sleepy Eye Chuck Todd. And then he's sitting there talking to Sleepy Eye Chuck Todd about how this stuff was all playing out. And he told Ch Chuck Todd, he said, well, you know, Chuck, uh, so I, uh, getting this information from British intelligence, and uh, I just, uh, so I set up this six agency inner, inner task force. You know, which combined heads of intelligence from the CIA, the FBI, the DOJ, NSD, uh, State Department, DOD, and he named the agencies, high-level people from those, and we worked with our British partners and our other Five Eyes intelligence partners, and we began this uh, operation to find out what was going on. So he actually told Chuck Todd this last summer, early last summer. In fact, it was before summer, like late spring. Um, so it's been out there for a long time. But it's one of those things, it was a fact that was out there, but it really didn't play into things. We couldn't really use it until recently. Now that we know what we know, that we've learned in the last couple of months about really how impactful the foreign intelligence was in getting all this started, now we can go back and say, oh, wait a minute, didn't Brennan say last year he was telling us he set up this interagency, six agency, uh, inter interagency type task force? which included Clapper and Peter has been stoking us. So that's something I hope to hear Sarah Carter reporting on very soon, as I'm hoping she'll discover this multi-agency uh, task force set up by John Brennan, uh, which we believe he set up uh, toward the end of May of 2016. And I was just digging through some of my notes and of course, uh, there was a BBC story that was reported in the summer of 2017, last summer, that Brennan's involvement started in April 2016. Now, when I first got this bit of information months and months ago, it really didn't mean that much. But now that I look at it in context with everything else and looking at how it plays in right into the perfectly into the time frame of this uh, six agency uh, interagency task force, it happens at the exact same time almost that the BBC is reporting that Brennan's involvement started in April 2016. And why would the BBC be reporting on that? Well, it's probably something was leaked to them from British intelligence. And that's probably what they were talking about. When they talk about the involvement, they were talking about the fact that CIA and British intelligence begin an actual uh, involvement in some sort of a operation, and that would have been exactly at that time. So we can now see where that report from the BBC plays into this interagency task force. We also know that Robert Hannigan came to Langley and met with John Brennan in the summer of 2016, right about the same time. Actually, it was a little bit after that. It was like more toward the latter part of the summer when he came here. And the question you have to ask here is why did Hannigan come here and meet with, uh, with Brennan? Because um, Hannigan is, was over uh, GCHQ. And GCHQ is like the NSA. It's not like the CIA. So it's not like Hannigan came over and met with his counterpart. If Hannigan was meeting with his counterpart, he would have met with Mike Rogers. But he didn't. He came and met with Brennan. 
CIA, which is like the British MI6. So why would the head of the NSA version of British intelligence meet with the regular CIA director? Why wouldn't he meet with the, you know, the signals guy and what would be our NSA? It's just like, why would John Brennan go meet with uh, GCHQ, uh, which is kind of like our version of NSA? Why would he do that? If he was going over there, you'd think he would meet with his counterpart, which would be MI6. That's a little curious, I think. But based on what we know about the relationship between Mike Rogers and the other two guys, Clapper and Brennan, it shouldn't surprise us. We know that Clapper uh, tried to get Mike Rogers fired after he went and briefed Trump at Trump Tower. We know that Brennan told the House Intelligence Committee on May the 23rd of 2017 that his information served as the basis for the FBI investigation. So there you go, Sarah Carter. That's what I'm talking about. Everybody's focusing and been focusing so much on Peter's been stroking us, the FBI and Comey, and we're now learning what many of us have known for a long time, that this stuff started long before, and it wasn't with the FBI. It started with the CIA. They're the ones that created it and fed it to the FBI. And so here you have Brennan even telling uh, the, the House Intel Committee on May, uh, in May of 2017, that he's, he's happy to take credit for the fact. He says, yeah, the information we gave the FBI served as the basis for the FBI counterintelligence operation. He's admitting to it, which tells you also that he was in cahoots with Peter's been stroking us, which is why Peter been stroking us was part of that uh, six agency inner uh, task force that he set up. We also, while Sarah Carter is on that, she might as well go ahead and take a look at the nature of the leaks. The nature of the leaks. Remember, the leaks were a big part of this operation, weaponizing the media. These very, very carefully placed, very carefully timed leaks, which were fairly devastating in a lot of cases. Maybe the most devastating of all the things they did. Most of their setups, uh, their frameups failed. Most of the fake intelligence they gave us got uh, blown out because they couldn't be verified. But the leaks were damaging and still continue to be. But the thing about the leaks is the nature of the leaks. And uh, this was pointed out by George Newmayer in an article about a couple of months ago. I can't remember when, a few months back. And I wrote it down. So the nature of the, of the leaks was that prior to the election on November 8th, before Trump won the election, um, most of those leaks, or those leaks primarily, the nature of them was about Russian interference in the election. But the day after the election, as soon as the election's over, Trump wins, the nature of the leaks completely flipped script and went into how Russian efforts, um, how Russian efforts, how the Russians made efforts to help Trump win. And that then, over the next couple months, continue to progress and work its way into Trump-Russia collusion. Trump actually working with the Russians. Now, one thing, just that the Russians were trying to help Trump win, but then they take it to the next extreme, which is, and that, yeah, the Russians were trying to help Trump win, getting involved in the election, but now Trump and his people around him may have been involved. And they've got all this data that they've been data mining with all this surveillance they've been doing to help them make the case. So you can see how this thing has just morphed itself along. They've had to do what they've had to do. First they had to take out Trump, then when he became president, uh, uh, first they had to try to stop him from being president. When that failed, then they had to take him down and uh, they're still trying to do that. But of course they have failed. That is not going to happen now. That ball game is over. Now, just before I go, I just want to, uh, again, make it crystal clear what I'm talking about happening here, what I believe happened very simply as I can without getting too confusing. Um, I'm telling you that John Brennan set up this six agency task force back around late May, early June of 2016, which of course uh, was working closely with British intelligence and possibly other uh, intel agencies of the Five Eyes countries. They took this raw data intelligence and they fed it through a loop. So it ended up back into the lap of the FBI where Peter Ben Strokinus was running the counter intel operation. He, so he took the, this, uh, this information that was being generated and, and this whole operation run, being run out of the Langley at the CIA by Brennan and his people in this task force. And they fed it all back to the FBI. 
and then um, that's that's basically the, the loop. Uh, and so it all started right there in the CIA. And I contend that that Operation uh, Crossfire, the only purpose that served was to justify getting the warrants and uh, putting in the informants and all the other things because the CIA cannot do that on American citizens, only on foreigners. So that's my explanation of that. Hopefully that's a little clearer. Thank you for tuning in. I'll be back.